From concerns about election hacking, through attacks on banks and other institutions such as Sony Pictures, to possible assaults on vital national infrastructure such as electrical grids or anything that operates online over the Internet, a new era in geopolitical rivalry and competition is dawning. Cyber warfare, the use of computers and high-tech devices and malicious software code to paralyze, or threaten to paralyze, vital components of a nation's national and economic security is a growing and evolving force. That evolution and its current state has been traced by David Sanger, an award-winning reporter and national security correspondent for the New York Times, in his latest book, released earlier this year, titled The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage, and Fear in the Cyber Age. Sanger will be giving what has become an annual talk at the Weston Playhouse this coming Sunday, August 19th, a fundraising event for the Playhouse. This year's talk is titled A World Turned Upside Down, Russia, North Korea, and the Crises of the Trump Era, and it will begin at 8 p.m. We had a chance to talk with Mr. Sanger about his latest book and where he saw the growing reality of cyber warfare leading. We started by asking him what he thought ordinary people should be most concerned about with regard to cyber warfare. So I think their concern shouldn't be as much the big cyber war, the unplugging of the grid from Boston to Washington or San Francisco to L.A., but rather the slow accretance of trouble from a low-level cyber conflict, because that's really what we're seeing. We're not seeing cyber war. We're seeing cyber used for short-of-war operations. Now, most people feel this in the most simple way, which is, you know, they get these notices that their credit card numbers have been compromised, or they get a year of free credit protection because some other form of information has been lost from an insurance company or the Office of Personnel Management or their medical firms or something like that. And what I think people are only now beginning to recognize is that while some of this is just criminal nonsense and a lot of it you can protect against with some pretty simple steps, two-factor authentication, you know, where a code is sent to your cell phone and so forth so that it's really, the bank knows it's really you who's doing the banking, that much of this is actually ordinary Americans being caught as the collateral damage in a broader cyber war that's taking place 30,000 feet above their heads. And that's in some ways the bigger worry because that's the daily a set of events that not only compromises your information, but undermines your confidence in institutions, whether it's that when you go to a polling place, your vote will be correctly recorded, or when you go to get in your autonomous car, it's going to drive you where you want to go instead of over a cliff. One of the paradoxes of cyber warfare is that the best defense is not always a good offense. In this conflict, Unlike in, say, nuclear conflicts, where you can say, if you destroy this city, we're going to destroy a similarly sized city of yours. In this conflict, the advantage all goes to the least wired society. You know, North Korea doesn't have as many uh, IP addresses as Manchester, Vermont, I would bet. But if they attack the United States, they recognize that the U.S. is vulnerable because everything we have is connected. And they're not vulnerable to similar, effect, uh, similar effects because they're not especially connected. So if you're going to do effective deterrence, you have to think about going after what your adversary values, not necessarily saying, I'm going to strike what you struck uh, in my world. And we've had a very difficult time coming to that because we're the most connected society. And not only are we the most connected society, we are increasing the number of those connections rapidly. So just think about this. Ten years ago, you had maybe one thing in your house that was connected to the Internet. It was probably your laptop or maybe your desktop computer. Today, you've got a couple of laptops, cell phone, the old cell phones that are st you know stuck away in your your. Uh, nightside table. Uh, you've got an Alexa, maybe, which is playing you music, but is also giving you reminders and doing all kinds of things. Your smart TV is probably connected. You may have one of those new internet-connected refrigerators, 
I don't. I've never quite figured out what I would do with an internet-connected refrigerator other than have it tell me not to eat as much. But uh, there are all kinds of things that are connected to the internet. And each one of them creates a new and bigger attack space for an adversary. So while we're getting better at cybersecurity and we're thinking about security in a way we never did a few years ago, we're getting worse faster because we're adding so many different appliances that can uh, make a difference here. Um, one of the more fascinating chapters in your book uh, was the bit about the, the, the hack in the 2016 election at the Democratic National uh, Committee headquarters and their emails and the Podesta emails. And it struck me as, as kind of like amazing that that all might have been avoided if, if that one guy had sent, had made a typo in his email and said illegitimate instead of legitimate. I mean, was that, was it something that simple or, or I mean, I, I would have had to assume that there were, there would have been some other attack at some point. Or you know, these, these cut both ways. So the North Koreans nearly got a billion dollars transferred out of the Bangladeshi central bank, but they made a spelling mistake too and spelled foundation, foundation, F-A-N-D-A-T-I-O-N. And somebody at the um, Federal Reserve Bank of New York noticed the spelling error and ended up stopping the transfer from happening. So there's a big element of error that takes place in here. And uh, uh, a lot of this uh, has to do with just getting lucky. Um. Do you, what, what do you think, in, in hindsight, the Obama administration should have done back in 2016 when it became aware of the fact that the Russians were meddling in the election in some way or another? Um, they were reluctant to expose the Russians uh, at that, that time. Um, in hindsight, was that the right approach to take, do you think, or should they have been a little more explicit? I, I don't think it was the right approach, but I think their bigger mistake actually came before the hack of the Democratic National Committee. The Russians had gone into the White House unclassified systems. They had gone into the State Department unclassified systems. They had gone into the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Early, a few years earlier, they had gone into a very classified Pentagon system called CIPRANET, which is how a lot of the Pentagon uh, uh, communicates with each other over a classified network. In none of those cases, did the United States call out the Russians as the one who was the offender? In none of them did they make them pay a price because their view was, oh, this is espionage. You know, we do it, they do it. Well, in fact, in, when they got around to the election hack, it wasn't just espionage. By making public the documents they had stolen, they were actually trying to affect public opinion in the election. And then there was the whole information warfare, you know, Facebook side of this. So I think the U.S. government made a significant mistake in not naming the offenders and not talking about how that could change if they came back and actually made Russia pay a price. And there were all kinds of proposals floating around the White House, cut off Putin's um, access to the international markets, uh, reveal his connections to the oligarchs, reveal the money that he's stashed away around the world. They decided in the end to do none of those, and I suspect that if they had that one to replay today, they'd probably do it differently. And where do things go from here? It doesn't end any more than terrorism ends, any more than the use of aircraft or drones end. The question is, can you control it and can you manage it? Look, if you want this to end, you move to Montana in an internet-free, cell phone-free zone and live in a log cabin and cut off all the rest of the world. We're not going to do that. We're addicted to a world of connectivity that brings around a world of productivity as well, right? And many great things. Just as we are not going to stop using airplanes just because in the 70s and 80s a lot of them got hijacked. And just as if we're not going to stop using drones just because we've discovered that the United States at times has launched attacks on civilians. So you can't operate in the theory that this is all going to come to a stop and we're going to wind the clock back to 1975. It's not going to happen. So then the question is, what do you do going forward? Treaties won't work in this area. This isn't like nuclear. It's not only states. You know, only states had nuclear weapons 
cyber weapons are in the hands of states, they're in the hands of non-state actors, they're in the hands of terrorists, criminals, and teenagers. Most of those groups do not sign treaties, right? So we're going to have to move to some kind of norms of behavior. Uh, Brad Smith of Microsoft, president of Microsoft, talks about a digital Geneva Convention where we think about certain things that are considered off limits to cyber attack. Will people violate those? Yeah, just like they violate the Geneva Conventions. You know, um, Bashar Assad wakes up every morning in Syria thinking about how he can violate the Geneva Conventions, right? But we've now, over time, come to agree that there are certain um, activities that we think should be completely off limits and might constitute war crimes if you go and do them. And over time, we have to decide what's off limits in cyber. That also means we have to think about what we're willing to give up. We might want to say you can't attack power grids and you can't attack election systems and certainly you can't attack hospitals and nursing homes and things like that. And yet, we have implants in foreign power grids. We've attacked a nuclear-related site in Iran. We've attacked missile sites in North Korea. So we have to think about what we're willing to give up if we're going to expect the rest of the world to give things up as well. For the GNET TV News Project, I'm Andrew McKeever.